Australian Special Forces units have the longest presence in Australia's longest war. They were there soon after United States forces drove Al-Qaeda from these mountains 10 years ago. And they are here in Afghanistan still. But for all of those 10 years, what they do and how they do it has been kept largely secret. The core of every, every guy within SASR that's to, in part, to strive for excellence in, in everything they do at all times, whether there's someone watching or not, whether there's going to be recognition or not. Kept secret until now. Here we join Australia's elite Special Air Service Regiment, the SASR. It's not about talking themselves up or anything like that, it's just about getting on with the job. Their brothers in arms, the commandos, also overcome acute camera shyness, taking us with them in pursuit of a Taliban commander. I will go out there and we'll face Taliban every day, put me in front of a camera or I'll shoot myself. <laughs> on the way here, plans changed. They heard on the radio that the Taliban commander was confirmed to be here in this motorcycle shop, so Plans changed and uh, the combat forces rushed this location. They're now searching a whole range of uh, local fighting age males. And they say that they've already identified uh, an IED facilitator. I think in the trade, that's called a jackpot. Don't get off the path. Complementing the commandos and the SASR is the Incident Response Regiment the combat engineers out in front who uncover the weapons caches, booby traps and hidden mines. Holy shit. I've had that twice where I've thought, I honestly thought to myself, is that next step the, uh, the step worth taking? The different force elements merge to make up Rotation 16 of Australia's Special Operations Task Group a truly unique band known throughout Afghanistan as Task Force 66. Free protection, let's go, facing that way. At the end of the day, we are just everyday people. We come to work, we do our work, and then we go home with our families. It's not like the movies. We do a job and we just get on with the job. We can hit from here too. This shit. Wanna take a shit, I ain't gonna shit us up. The Afghanistan home for Australia's Special Operations Task Group is at Taran Kot, in the sparse, rugged and largely primitive Uruzgan province. Special Forces is secreted in a fortress within a fortress at Camp Russell, named in honour of Sergeant Andrew Russell, the first Australian soldier killed in Afghanistan. We are allowed to move freely among the soldiers and ask what we like with no one looking over the shoulders. But there are restrictions. For the most part, we can't identify them. We've also agreed to avoid exposing trade secrets, what they call their tactics, techniques and procedures. And the fact that we're so secretive by necessity for how we do business means that a lot of, uh, a lot of speculation can go on. But you will be taken to their battlefield. Where are they? Top of the feature, one left. You will see what they see. And you will hear their views on the war they fight. This is not like any war we've been in previously, and we're trying to do it right. Some of the soldiers we join are veterans of multiple rotations. This commando won a Medal of Gallantry for an action that saw the death of a comrade, Luke Worsley, in November 2007. The contact one of thousands exemplifies the complexity of a war with no front line or neutral space.
Tier, tier five one. Just tango four one. We just engaged two enemy in the uh, in the alleyway. Stand by for fire support. Jesus. In 10 years of operations, Special Forces has accumulated 40 bravery medals, including two Victoria Crosses. Let's go, let's go. In 2007, this young corporal scaled a mountain to enter the lion's den, in this case a cave of a Taliban commander. Uh, when I locked eyes, uh, he locked eyes with me, it's approximately you know, 10 metres, uh, I could notice that he had a weapon down the side of him, and uh, it was uh, essentially uh, both weapons up, and it was who was the quickest to the trigger. This soldier is one of many to return to battle bearing the scars of previous combat. Our lead scout was shot and I also received uh, a rounds hit my personal weapon and then uh, fragments went through my face, through my ear. There was a lot of blood, obviously uh, your head injuries bleed a lot more than anywhere else on the body. Um, I crawled over to the, to the medic just to make sure that it was nothing vital and uh, once he gave me the thumbs up we, we continued on with the fight. Holy... The battlefield's changed significantly. Uh, I believe the threat has become far more complex. Uh, the, the, the Taliban and insurgent commanders have, have accurately realised that their strength is their ability at times to move within the population. Uh, and you've also seen the emergence of the IED threat uh, over the years. Uh, and that IED threat provides, you know, provides a lot of challenges as, as much for the local population and the local law enforcement as it does for us. The SAS head out, attending to their main business, counter leadership, or what some have come to term, kill capture. You looked at our processes and we felt that kill capture were, was an inappropriate term. Um, it was an inaccurate term, in fact. Uh, it implies that um, it's, as, it's as simple and black and white as that. We seek to neutralise a commander and we remain, um, you know, we, we do a lot of analysis into what the best method of that neutralisation might be. The helicopter enables further reach to Kaz Uruzgan, which has seen a lot of fighting. In August, an Australian soldier, Private Matthew Lambert, had been killed by an IED. In the following weeks, the SAS returned to Kazura's gun, and on September 10, they hit what they called a jackpot, killing three further insurgents and a master bomb maker, Mullah Abdul Qadir. The Taliban leader had commanded a cell of 30 fighters in the area. Now that particular insurgent commander had been active uh, in Uruzgan for about two and a half, three years uh, and had a lot of linkages to um, uh, the Kasuruzgan district. The force element had interrupted a shura or meeting returning also with a cache of weaponry. The significance of this particular weapon is it's an AKS-74. Uh, and AK-74 are a Soviet-era weapon, and in Afghanistan they're reasonably uncommon. So those insurgent commanders that we come across, they're in possession of them, it's an indication of their seniority. It's seen as a, a status symbol, um, and they're also worth a lot of money, so therefore uh, a low-level insurgent is, is very unlikely to be in possession of one of these weapons. The Taliban leader, codenamed JDAM, had been on the JPEL, or Joint Priority Effects List. The effective hit list has attracted criticism that it hardens and further radicalises the Taliban and that the coalition gets it wrong. If there's ever a, a, an allegation that comes through that, that, that we've done the wrong thing, there's something that not only the regiment but, but the individual soldiers take very seriously and it weighs very heavily on guys' minds. While most of the fighting takes place outside the wire, it's not as if the main base escapes attack. From the closer range of hills, insurgents regularly fire rockets, largely aimed at the coalition's terror weapon, the helicopter. The 107 rockets are generally set on a crude timer, so the insurgents can be gone before the coalition's immense firepower turns on them. You know, now we've got a, uh, a counter rocket and mortar a device set up there which has got 360 degree and 24 hours a day coverage of uh, incoming uh, rockets and mortars.
In the early evening, sensors pick up signs of an imminent rocket attack. We are near the flight line as we hit the ground. Two rockets strike, generating more noise than harm. It's okay to squeal if you want to. There's some close call stories about people who decided they needed to go for a piss in the middle of the night or got up, got up to go for a smoke and the rocket lands and it's landed in their bed space. So there's a few close calls. The Special Operations Task Group is mostly male and mostly it works outside the wire. It's small enough to be close. Females make up 5% of the company of 300. Headquarters remains in close contact. Look, it's, it's definitely not a video game. It's not, you know, this is, this is life and death uh, uh, sort of stuff. So it's not, um, it's not something that you can, uh, you can pause and replay. The prospect of not coming back has to be on the minds of some of these men as they board two Australian CH-47s. It's always tense when there's an incident going on outside the wire. I think everybody picks up on that emotion. The Taliban has been heard on radio relaying warnings to not fire at the elephants, as they call the Australian Chinooks, which can reply with 4,000 rounds a minute. Next, we see for ourselves the immense responsibility that accompanies the immense firepower in the hands of young soldiers. The dawn breaks the next morning on a significant day. The dominant event that brought Australians to Afghanistan in the first place was of course September 11. The dominant ally that keeps Australia here is the United States. And for the US, 10 years on, it is still personal. Uh, our army went through a transformation that, that's unlike any that, that it, we've ever seen before since, since World War II. It brought uh, a lot of nations together, you know. The anniversary is no quiet day for the Australians. Out in the Char Chinna Valley, the sniper teams are already secreted as part of a large Afghan National Security Force push to clear the valley of Taliban. One of the teams that identified uh, a number of insurgents that were uh, uh, operating the area and obviously uh, you know, in, in self-defense uh, called in a, uh, a hellfire uh, strike. An unmanned US drone locks on the target and releases. Once launched, soldiers spot children moving into the area. Uh, that's when uh, the teams on the ground identified uh, children had actually moved into the engagement area and that's when uh, uh, we made the call to pull that rocket off station and, and put it into a safe area. They do measure up, they're all very aware, they are mature. They know what we're here to do and they know what we're here to avoid. On the following afternoon, further reinforcements board two Army Chinooks. It takes 15 minutes to fly what in a Bushmaster would have taken days. The problem of approaching on the ground also means the active Taliban spotter network can relay warnings. As they touch down, from the distant tree line, there is sporadic shooting. And obviously just prior to them hitting the deck, um, uh, we had like multiple RPGs and RCLs sort of uh, landing in, in, in and around the, uh, the helos at that time. We got more deck around our rear too. Gotcha. We've got two teams moving from right to left. Go, covering! The commandos, often in larger numbers than the SAS, work on disrupting areas where there are higher concentrations of insurgents. Yeah, children moving left to right. Let's go! 
Go, just go. They certainly uh, move out to the periphery areas that we've found rather than uh, remaining in the area to attempt to, to try and um, deny us from uh, carrying out our mission. The successes uh, that we had in that area over the two days were significant. Enemy KIA. One enemy KIA on your yep. The commandos have been in the Charchina Valley now for two days. With local Afghan forces and the Incident Response Regiment, they search largely empty compounds. Joe, the explosive detection dog, hunts for caches of weapons and hidden mines. Nothing phases him, which is good. Uh, most of our dogs need to be fairly bold. To the SASR and commandos, the incident response engineers are brothers in arms. IRR was out there in front of us every day. Never rest, like always um, clearing the way for us. You know, we're out there actively seeking the enemy. They're out there actively finding the unseen enemy of IEDs and booby traps. You know, just such cool, calm and collected dudes. Uh, they look fear in the face every day and just get on with it. In March 2009, the Special Forces Incident Response Regiment lost its first member killed in action. The guys all know the guys within our unit very well and we're a fairly tight unit, so any sort of loss like that hits, uh, hits everyone pretty hard. Take Brett Till, for example, like he had, uh, you know, obviously his family at home and, you know, when you, when you have a family, I guess you'd seem to understand that a little bit more. When we join Rotation 16 as the football's final season approaches at home, the fighting season here is already underway. Yeah, everyone's absolutely pumped. Uh, everyone's uh, looking forward to it. We've received uh, some significant amount of intelligence regarding a Taliban drug lab in uh, Northern Helmand. Over 120 soldiers, mostly commandos, alongside teams of Afghan police from the Narcotics Interdiction Unit and local special response team, will fill two US C-130s. They will cross into a neighbouring province where previous fighting has been far fiercer. It was estimated that we had up to 5,000 uh, um, insurgents against us, which was, our, which was our aim to draw them up to us so this relief in place could happen. They had indirect fire support, we had indirect fire support. Uh, they had heavy machine guns, we had heavy machine guns. It was large-scale offensive fighting. An Australian commando is dead and another soldier seriously wounded after battling the Taliban. I extend my deepest sympathy to Sergeant Langley's family, his friends and comrades. Earlier in Helmand was the beginning of a savage run for special forces. These steps proved the last for an experienced and decorated commando, Sergeant Brett Wood. You right, you right here. You right, you right. Within weeks in the same area, Sapper Rowan Robinson and Sergeant Todd Langley were also lost. Every spike in casualties challenges the rationale for being in Afghanistan, as well as extending risk by moving outside Uruzgan. The lines on the maps here were drawn generally uh, by us or, or by you know, nations that, that, that uh, came before us. Lines on maps don't mean a lot to uh, the Taliban and particularly insurgent commanders. In fact, if anything, lines on maps are where they locate themselves because uh, it's something that, uh, something that we don't exploit and they use to their advantage. The counter nexus mission, as it's known, is driven by intelligence gathered by the US Drug Enforcement Agency. For the DEA, the earlier incursions into Hellman have also been costly. This agent, just one to have suffered a gunshot wound. The shared losses have helped form a unique partnership with Task Force 66. It's something that we've been striving as DEA to uh, get a strong partnering relationship with military entities. The relationship is remarkable. Overnight, commandos move in one blocking force commanding the higher ground. 
I don't think you could have slept. You know, the the, the mood and the uh, you know, because you know that you're going into a fairly hostile sort of area. Uh, you know, you get fairly uh, g'd up for it. In the dark, commando assaulters bump the enemy. This soldier forced into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Upon our moving back to our block, uh, we came across another two insurgents, and I took one back as a detainee. The other one was killed. That's right. In the observation post to the west, as dawn breaks, further targets present and seven more insurgents are killed. A lot of their spotter and uh, scouting networks are moving in to uh, obviously put eyes on uh, friendly dispositions further down the valley. Obviously we were positioned a little bit further out. Uh, we obviously got eyes on them and then uh, uh, you know, neutralised those targets uh, in accordance. The operation is monitored back at base by a range of eyes in the sky. At dawn, the DEA, Afghans and Australians overwhelm the drug lab. Thousands of kilograms of opium base and precursor chemicals, plus refined heroin is found. The engineers quickly rig the chemicals and equipment for destruction. The loss of hundreds of millions of dollars is not taken easily. Closer to the drug lab, an insurgent marksman gets into position to direct accurate fire. Everyone good up there? By 11 a.m., the task force is beginning to take casualties. A round came in and it seemed quite close to me. It felt a pinch initially. Um, I didn't think anything, anything of it. Uh, five, five seconds later, I tried to move my leg and my leg was paralysed. Then I started getting uh, stomach pains and that's when I called the guys, yeah, I'm being hit, I can't move my leg. Three coalition members have received gunshot wounds. The Australian among them is Category A, which means getting treatment within what they call the golden hour. They cut everything open and started looking for fragmentation wounds and like going through all my intestines. This is the HLZ. The stretcher bearers definitely exposed themselves to, to get me to that bird, so and it was, I think it was probably about uh, 10, 15 minutes of running with me, running me. Let's go. Get the two dudes behind you. We're going to go secure the cornfield. Well, let's push back. The Australian soldiers retaliate, suppressing the marksmen. Their comrade is soon evacuated by helicopter to a British hospital. Especially in Helmand, uh, the uh, insurgency and uh, narco trafficking is, uh, you're not able to separate it one from the other. In a conflict where clear measures of success don't come easily, the counter nexus mission delivers serious pain to the Taliban as well as demonstrates a smarter approach to targeting by avoiding alienating the poppy growers. The reason we do this, of course, is so that we're not having an adverse effect on the general population and their ability to have a, have a livelihood. So we tend to try and target between the selling and the distribution, which we've been able to do extremely effectively this year. The uh, uh, profit off of the narcotics production and sales in this country does fund the insurgency, uh, which leads to additional IEDs, additional ammunition, and the capability for the insurgency to put up a larger fight for coalition forces. In the next segment, we return to a Taliban hotspot to see how the fighting has evolved. Be, uh, three ones call, ones the mission this time is to another out. Taliban sanctuary closer to home. An advance by the Afghan National Security Forces in the Mirabad Valley has pushed the Taliban into one of their sanctuaries in the Chinna Kalai Valley. Watch out! Oh, 
Inspector Albert, we believe one possible KIA, uh, the other one to be confirmed. We are moving back to the south to establish an HLZ over. Okay, well, they're, they're close, boss. They're close, boss. It was here in 2008 when commandos from Delta Company, returning from a two days patrol, saw the hills light up like a Christmas tree. Can we get those Apaches uh, in to try and identify these targets? Over. We've walked into a f***ing bait trap. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! The ambush demonstrates the vulnerability of the long-range vehicle patrols of old. The fighting continued for two hours, Dutch Apaches eventually rocketing the hillside. Let's go, let's go, let's go. We uh, manoeuvred into the village itself and um, we came under fire, we were ambushed. Um, within about the first 10-15 minutes, um, Jason was killed unfortunately and about another four or so members were wounded. It was two days after Anzac Day. We lost colleagues that we, you know, whose mannerisms we can still remember, things like that, you know. Uh, they're not just, they're not just a statistic and they're not something that uh, we're here to avenge, we're here to, I suppose, more or less honour what they're over here in the first place. The mission to the same location begins with a mixed objective, partly to win hearts and minds and partly to hunt Taliban. On the way in, the atmosphere ramps up when fresh intelligence indicates a target is present. There's a dude that's uh, just squirted from the motorcycle shop pretty quick on his motorbike. He's f***ing hurting. Be on the muddy cover of Buddy across the demon. The compound is 500 metres from the landing zone. There are shouted instructions to follow the footsteps of the man in front. Spread out a bit, mate. So essentially, uh, during the flight in, we received um, more intelligence indicating that uh, persons of interest are in these uh, certain compounds. We've had to adjust the plan to uh, cater for that. One target has, as they put it, squirted on a motorbike, but a second target, a suspected IED facilitator, okay. is detained. The locals have in turn also made a discovery. A sniper team in the hills above has been spotted and suspected Taliban are attempting to encircle them. ICOM suggested if uh, they come in the green, uh, they'll share this up. A kid, probably younger than uh, 10 years old, probably you know, eight years old, six, uh, was uh, his little brother, I guess. You could see them uh, start departing from the village with a, a herd of goats. Uh, and it came pretty clear that, that that herd of goats was probably gonna make uh, contact with our position. Quite often they'll use children. The children will come up into our positions uh, within the green belt, uh, come up, just having a look at us, then they'll walk off and report. And we've seen them, you can see them walk off and then report to adults. Hey, brother. Yep. We've got a tunnel down here. Oh, sorry. Got a Back in the compound, caches are found, but they are empty. We're not finding weapons or caches within compounds. They're all in uh, adjacent fields. Local nationals who have seen it all before seem to take the intrusion in their stride. And what about the bad people? How do they treat you? Through an interpreter, I ask for their reaction. 
He said, uh, no bad people have ever even came for him to even know how to answer that question. He says, uh, you will be lucky if you even saw one in the mountain right now. The men say there are no Taliban here, that they are farmers trapped in the middle. The soldiers are skeptical. Asking these people which side they're on can often seem to be pointless. Uh, they're obviously going to be on the side of their family, uh, their tribe and uh, whichever powerful force happens to be around on any given day. It's a, an extraordinarily difficult uh, question to answer which side they're on. And of course, that's the problem that the soldiers face every single day. Soon after, the men are detained when ammunition and detonators are found by the Afghan partner force. Oh, they're actually very good. They'll, they can, uh, they'll find stuff that we can't find before their technology. More and more operations are now like this, with no shots fired and suspected Taliban taken into custody. Next, a day with Australia's elite SASR. One of the biggest changes to occur on the battlefront is revealed through this next unique experience. What targets are, are we likely to be able to prosecute today? Um, and what effects we can achieve on the network by targeting these people? So have there been any developments? Um, yes. Yeah. Last night we had um, a fair bit of information that came in that's enabled us to develop a series of um, uh, mission plans, I guess you could say, um, that are basically sitting on the shelf waiting for this morning. So that's what we're about to see? Yes. We are entering the Special Operations Command and Control Centre to start a day with the SAS. This is where the battle is monitored, where the intelligence accumulates and where what matters even more than the fighting, the thinking, is done. We've had plenty of occasions where we've had um, intelligence that's, that's given us a start point uh, and then we start bringing other layers and fusing other forms of intelligence over the top. Uh, it might be uh, you know, an initial rumour that starts from, from within the local population and then we use some sensors to confirm whether, whether uh, that is true or not. In the ready room alongside is another practical asset, the US Army Air Wing. We're going to launch a, uh, a morning uh, vehicle interdiction package up towards uh, Kalach. Uh, we've, we've, we've got some reliable intelligence suggesting a few of the, uh, a few of the key insurgent commanders from up that way are starting to be, uh, be pushed back in. To respond swiftly to intelligence alerts, the SAS needs helicopters. Everybody's playing for helicopters. Everybody wants helicopters. So for these guys to have the amount of, uh, if you will, dedicated assets, for the rotary wing package is, is almost unheard of uh, any, anywhere you go and it's, it's because of that relationship that we established early on. Out on the flight line at this one base is the equivalent of the entire Australian rotary wing fleet. The two areas that we're focusing on is KTV and the Kalaj Valley. There is reports that uh, insurgent commanders are coming into the area and uh, we're going to uh, restrict their freedom of movement by conducting uh, uh, vehicle interdiction uh, along known rat lines pretty much uh, in this sort of area between the two valleys in this uh, very canalised terrain. The Blackhawks will head north. The modern approach to long-range patrolling is a long way from the days when vehicles would roll out for weeks at a time into areas where you did not need to be Taliban to oppose all invaders. There's certainly, uh, certainly instances of uh, coalition being caught in the middle of crossfire between uh, warring tribal factions. Uh, that, that, that is a feature of, of this battlefield and that, that's what makes the job that the, you know, the, the guys do so much more admirable. In modern warfare's version of random breath testing, one Black Hawk swoops down, a smoke grenade fired to warn the vehicle to stop. Observing one by motorbike with one by military age male brake. Motorbike moving north or south, intended into this over.
As with random breath testing, there's a lot of tedium and the occasional jackpot. Among the intelligence gathered are tests for indications of explosive residue and fingerprints, which can help convict bomb makers. Ask him if um, he knows of any Taliban in the area. Well, the Taliban, barikum al mar, there is there is shaw khakil. Yeah, well, like it's al mar, there is a khubad al matruwan, so there is matr chalo woman. The worst chupki of such khat burikti. He goes back a few days ago and everything. They would walk around the village and everything, but right now they disappeared. The search is undertaken while a second Black Hawk, with snipers at the ready, hovers above. In a week of interdiction missions, one rifle is recovered, nine suspects are detained, and one insurgent is killed. While the results appear slight to the SAS, there is a positive. Usually, at this time, the fighting season peaks, but now fewer targets are presenting. Some of them are the very senior levels who uh, feel that they've done their bit uh, and that they have no desire to come back and risk their lives anymore. Next we go to the vexing question of trust following a series of fatal attacks on Australian soldiers by their Afghan partners. The SAS is going out again. You have to be here to get a sense of the sheer relentlessness of all this. Uh, you'll see the men in the morning in the mess with the camouflage paint still on, having come back from a mission, and then soon after, like now, another crew is going out. And what is also hard to get your head around is the fact that going out is what they'd rather do. Every mission must be conducted with a representation of at least 33% of the partner force, in this case Afghan police from the local special response team, who are different. If we catch a Taliban unarmed, he'll come back here and go to jail for a few years, but if he's caught, he will, uh, you know, they'll kill him, regardless of whether he's armed or unarmed. We're governed by rules where these guys have their rules, they're slightly different to ours. Like we had 12 prisoners, uh, 12 detainees the other day, and uh, Usman knew that they were Taliban and he wanted to kill them right then and there, and I said, no, you can't. There is no denying the degree of difficulty. In November, three Australians were killed by an enemy masquerading as a friend. This followed an earlier murder of an Australian army cook by an Afghan ally. Afghan police in particular have had a poor reputation for collaborating with the Taliban, for extorting the local population and for drug use. I haven't seen them smoke marijuana at all, but in the early days they used to, and a lot of Australians would refuse to go out on patrol with them because they were under the influence of marijuana. I guess at the end of the day, if, if I prefer not to work with them, then Afghanistan will never ever be its own country. Um, I'm happy to work with them. Uh, I've been left alone with them. Um, to, for them providing me security while I've been doing some bits and pieces. The bomber packed 1,500... The coalition's gains do have a way of becoming shrouded in the dust of the latest IED blast or suicide bomb attack. You've been here eight times now, is that right? Ah, uh, yes, eight. Yeah. So, uh, is it getting better? It's a difficult question, Chris. Um, when we first got here back... In, when I first got back here in 2002, um, you could drive around in uh, non-armoured cars, just civilian cars, drive around Tarankau, it was quite safe. But now you wouldn't step out of the gate unless you're in an up-armoured vehicle uh, like a Humvee or like our Bushmasters because the IED threat is quite bad. Now whether we brought that into town because we're here or because we've decided to partner with the uh, SRT boys, I don't know. As our month with Special Forces draws to a close, it is grand final weekend back at home. It seems fitting. Prominent among the soldiers' reasons given for being here is you don't train all your life to sit in the dressing room on the big day. Of course I believe in the effort, but I more believe in the blokes next to me. 
Um, I don't want them to be in a fight without me. Pretty much, and I think they'd think the same. I think it would be a wrongdoing for us to walk away halfway um, through the operation. I think it would be very un-Australian not to finish a job that you started. We can't simply go into or go into a conflict and simply leave after we've caused damage and, and we're trying to do the right thing and stabilise our country before we leave. I think that's the right thing to do. There are a thousand ways to tell the Afghanistan story and not one of them would be perfectly accurate. But this story, told largely from the soldiers' perspective, is important, not just because they are here and risking their lives, but because they are good witnesses. And what is consistently intriguing is the difference between what they see and the view back home. We begin tonight with the Australian Defence Force and its chief hitting back at growing calls for the withdrawal of our troops from Afghanistan. You know, if you're sitting next to uh, someone at an airport or uh, you're just sort of having a, a conversation with another friend back at home, uh, I would say that the most question I get asked is, are we really making progress over there? What do you say? Uh, I say yes, yes, we are making progress. Um, Quite often the only thing that the public may hear is that when there is a uh, unfortunate incident which has occurred, as opposed to the many uh, very good missions that are completed that do have a significant effect on the, on the battle space. So uh, I think it's a, it's a great concept that we're, we're opening our doors a little bit, I guess, so to allow the public to, to you know, properly understand that what's happening over here um, from both our own perspective and the rest of the Australian forces as well. I think now that we've got that trust and there's, a, and there's an established government, there's established procedures. Uh, I think, you know, it's going to start moving forward. Australian Special Forces actively avoid recognition. They are practised at keeping their secrets. A curious consequence is the ugly gains of their enemy can be better known than their own measured, disciplined and often magnificent endeavours.